Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to introduce to you Mr. Ross Jackson, Regional Head of Cross-Border Business for Visa International, who starts this morning's keynote session. Thank you, Russ, for that introduction. This conference, as we know, marks 60 years that Carter has been a cornerstone of many phases of changing customer needs and growth in the travel industry. And for over 53 of those years, Visa has been providing payment services for travelers. Today, it's our pleasure to be the premier payment partner of Carter as it embarks on a new stage of growth to support and enable a changing industry and their customers. At Visa, we meet those changing needs of customers through product and service innovation and by processing more than 20,000 transactions every second from millions of locations over 200 countries around the globe. Helping travelers ease the burden of cash and currency exchange across borders is one of our key priorities. Our two keynote speakers today are also at the forefront of a new wave of technology and change. Each is stretching the boundaries of tourism and aerospace in a way that was unimaginable just a few decades ago, proving once again that change also presents great opportunities. Our keynote session will delve into the numerous advances in space industry today and entertain the exciting possibilities space travel can bring to the travel industry. And wherever this industry lets travelers explore, be it this planet or the next, Visa will be there as a partner to provide payment services and make tourism go. Because we doubt the future generation of space adventurers will want to carry coins and notes into space. It's therefore my pleasure to start the keynote session by introducing you to the moderator of today's keynote speech, Mr. Richard Quest, CNN's foremost international business correspondent and presenter of Quest Means Business to open the keynote session, and he will formally introduce our two esteemed speakers. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You've sat and been patient and listened for some time. Now it is our time to put some pepper onto the proceedings. It is time to put a bit of oomph into patter to try and get a bit of discussion going. Good grief, look at that picture. Clearly taken in better years. If I say the word to you, space, somebody in this room will follow on with the phrase, space, yeah, not that one. Come on. Think television programs. Space. The final frontier. If I say the phrase to you, one small step for man, you'll know it finishes off with one giant leap for mankind. Whether it's space as the final frontier, one small step, ground control to Major Tom, we are all absolutely fascinated by the business of space. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers for this part of the session, because they really know something about space. First, Mr. Yu Deng Yin, the Deputy Chief Director of the Council for Science and Technology of China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation. Mr. Yu is an expert in his field. He is well versed in the development of manufacture of spacecraft and launch vehicles. Thank you, Katinka. Joining Mr. Yu is Eric Anderson chairman and co-founder of Space Adventures, 
Eric is one of the leading entrepreneurs in space travel industry. He has led the development of commercial human space flight. If you have a few million dollars to spare, whether you pay by American Express or Visa, I'm sure Visa will be most acceptable. Eric will take the money off you, Eric. But I'm told he wants the money up front. Good morning. Good morning. You can have a seat. And please, at various points during the proceedings, we will be stopping for some questions from yourselves. You've been far too silent for far too long. It's time for you to get involved. It's your conference. Eric, we'll start with you, though. Um, the core question, why we are fascinated by space. What is it about space that, that we find attractive? That's an excellent question. I, I, uh, I have three small children, and uh, I am continually amazed at the innate curiosity that they have, that we all have. And to me, uh, from my experience, understanding why people would choose to go to space, and frankly, you know, as you mentioned, spend so much money on an experience, it really comes down to this innate curiosity that we all have. We've all grown up seeing the night sky. We wonder what's there. We wonder if we're alone. Uh, space represents the unknown. It is symbolic of, hu the, of, the, uh, of the seeking of human knowledge. And oh. it really comes down to curiosity. Oh, all right. Everybody wants to know, if I want to send the chairman, Mr. Thore, if I want to shoot him into space tomorrow, how much are you going to charge me? Uh, well, the, the flights, we can't send them tomorrow. Uh, All right. We, we have to wait a few. But the, the going price for a flight to the space station yeah. to visit the International Space Station for about two weeks uh, is 50, 50 odd million dollars. 50 US yeah, US million dollars. dollars. Let me ask you, ladies and gentlemen, assuming money was no object, and that is the core question, money is no object, how many of you would stump up 50 million to go to the space station for two weeks. Mr. Chairman. It's not bad. <laughs> yes, he, he can. <laughs> uh, Mr. Yu, China, in its role in the space industry, you are, you're catching up fast, but what is the goal for China in the space industry? Thank uh yeah, but, but we don't need to get on a rocket and go there. I mean, you know, I, I know there's a lot of places that are up there, but I don't have to see them. What I'm trying to understand is, why do you think we want to go into space. Uh, 
地球的太阳系里面，相当于是两两千亿分之一个，在银河系里面应该说有两千到一千到两千亿个太阳系，所以说这个地球应该是非常小的，宇宙是非常大的，所以我们每个人都希望好奇，希望到更广阔的天地里面去，去呃这个遨游，所以这是一个非常神往的地方。Eric, the the way in which space tourism has begun in some very, um, for want of a better word, very nascent, very junior ways, but very expensive ways, hasn't it? Absolutely. And uh, I guess people often ask me, well, my goodness, it's so expensive. When will the price come down? It won't. I say, well, I can't tell you when it will come down, but I can tell you it'll never go down if it didn't start being expensive. And if you go back and look at the beginning of all sorts of product technological advances, in the beginning, you know, computers were the size of this stage and, and, had, the, and had the ability to compute you know, what we have in our wristwatch today. Right, but, but let's just take what's on offer and the potential for what's on offer at the moment. Uh, you have these, uh, w which nobody is doing yet, but Sir Richard and yourselves, Sir Richard Branson and yourselves and a few others, are aiming to do suborbital, basically up and down flight transfer. That's right. So suborbital flight, not to be confused with real space flight to orbit. These are uh, uh, small vehicles, sort of the size of business jets, that would take the passengers up well over 100 kilometers and back down, uh, not the energy required to reach orbit, uh, a small fraction of that, probably a hundredth of that energy. Uh, you, but you would still sort of reach the edge of space and float weightless for two or three minutes and get your, your astronaut wings, if you will. Um, but not the same experience as visiting the space right. station or a now, space hotel. And, that, like and that. that you will run the cost of what? Uh, between 100 and 200,000 US dollars. All right, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> you can put your 50 million back in your US government treasuries. <laughs> Who would like to spend 100, 150K for how long is it going to be? Uh, a few minutes in space. A few minutes in space. How many? Hi, right, Mr. Chairman. Anyone else? Yeah, a few people. You would. You would. Of course. Would you? Would you, Mr. Mr. Yu? Would you spend? If you had 150,000, would you want to do? Would, is this an experience you would want to enjoy? Uh,应该说这个太空的旅游啊，确实非常奇妙。但是我想跟大家这个表达一个一个想法，就是我们的太空旅游。或者航天旅游不仅仅是要飞到太空里面去，呃，飞到太空里面去确实刚才这个安德森说的，我们应该是非常昂贵的，而且我们的对每个人的身体要求非常苛刻，所以不是每个人都能够想去就能去的，啊，应该是这个受众是很有限的，但是我们应该把航天的旅游或者太空旅游把它拓展，更主要是利用我们航天的这个地面的资源，把它充分利用起来。我们现在旅游主要是。人文的景观、自然的景观，但是我们对航天这个领域，应该说广大的受众还是非常这个神秘探索，应该是呃无无止境的，而且对我们航天的这个神秘感呢，应该大多部分这个受众或者大部分这个人民都是非常有点神秘感。比方说我们这个地面的这个太空的一些资源，我们的发射场，我们的这个卫星，我们的这个火箭的构型，大家肯定我都一般的这个。呃，人民肯定都是非常好奇。如果把这些资源能够开发出来，供大家去旅游，这个我相信不仅要使大家能够满足他的好奇心，还能得到享受，同时还能获得知识。我以为这是大家都希望的。我想这个是一个很好的一个事情。Well, well I think anyone who's been to uh, around Cape Canaveral, around uh, Orlando in Florida, uh, certainly can have seen that you, you've seen a large, vast amount of uh, of tourism. Is this your understanding too, Eric? Uh, absolutely. I think that ground-based space tourism, if you will, is a big market. In fact, did you know that the most visited museum in the world is the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C.? And so uh, it's something like 12 or 13 million visitors per year. And, and uh, the gentleman is absolutely correct in that uh, uh, for those who will never make it to space, uh, the ability to get some small part of that inspiration and that curiosity uh, through movies and, and ground-based entertainment and, and all the technology can bring us on the Earth is a, is a wonderful, wonderful idea and a great market.
And that also allows us all to take part, doesn't it? Because even if you can't get on a rocket and whoosh yourself up there, the ability to feel you are part of the game is important. Eric. Sure, sure. Totally agree. And uh, I, I, you find very few people in my business who aren't <coughs> at least somewhat inspired by, most people are quite inspired, and, and uh, but only very few are not really inspired at all by space travel. So even those who don't go would love to do things like that on the ground. When you're space tourists, and I've interviewed two or three of them over the years, and in fact I interviewed one of your space tourists live from the space station. Um, Mark um, Shuttleworth. Shuttleworth. I interviewed live from the space station some years ago. <clears throat> when they write the check or do the bank transfer to you, what do they say? Well, uh, they say, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, in fact, the best, so, so if, if the real question is, is it worth the money? Um, I think the best example of the answer being yes, and you can ask all of them this, was that one of our clients ended up going twice. So uh, he, he didn't get enough the first time, and in fact said he would, uh, not only was it worth every penny, <coughs> but uh, frankly, he would go as often as he could in the future. Now, bearing in mind this is a PATA conference, there is somebody in this room that wants to ask the question, did he get a discount for bulk purchase? <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, he, he didn't. Uh, by that time, the price had gone up, and so he actually paid more the second time. Than and you were saying the price has actually doubled from what it started at, hasn't it? More than <coughs> doubled. The original, the original price 10 years ago, we're, we're actually approaching the 10th anniversary of the first uh, space tourist, uh, which will be really just in a few days, which is coincident with the 50th anniversary of human spaceflight, which I'm sure you'll mention. Um, but uh, the price has tripled since then. It was 20 million, and now it's just you know close to close to 60, low 50s. Okay. But it's still a bargain in some oh, ways. Oh come on! Well, the, come on. For example, <coughs> the, the, the the space shuttle, which is a wonderful vehicle that you know, was <laughs> built by NASA, of course, and is being retired, actually cost about two billion dollars U.S. dollars per flight. And if you calculate the per seat cost for a crew of seven, you're looking at roughly three, you know, just under $300 million per seat. Okay, but do you have any embarrassment at the, at the very prospect that what you are selling is something that only the ultra, ultra rich can afford? And if space is to be for everyone, maybe a freebie for someone who's poor wouldn't go amiss. So we're actually, it's a wonderful, so no, I'm not embarrassed, thank you. Um, but, uh, but things like what we've been working on for some time and we're very close to being able to announce a program like this, a lottery, uh, a basically a, a way of democratizing this very expensive cost across millions of people. And there are a number of ways we're looking at doing that. Pause for one moment. <coughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, you wouldn't pay 50 million a few of you would pay a couple of hundred grand. If I offer you a lottery ticket to take part in the International Space Station flight, how many of you want a ticket? You're a bunch of <laughs> freeloaders, aren't you? <laughs> uh, talk about no such thing as a free lunch. Mr. Yu, <coughs> as we look at the, the role of what you see China's role in the future, because in the future there will be perhaps three or four global space consortia. NASA from the United States, European Space uh, Administration Union, uh, the Russians. Where will China, uh, the Indians, there's lots of others, but where will China fit into that? I think we have to the so 
所以我还是一个观点，我是跟安生这个不太一样，我是觉得还是我们要立足于把地面的航天设施这一块充分利用起来，在地面能够感受到太空的奇妙，啊，因为花很少的钱，而且不需要对你的身体有很过多的要这个要求。刚才说光是有钱，你有钱了，如果你身体不行，你也很难到天上去，啊，这个是很难到天上去。Explain what you mean about use ground facilities. What are you talking about here? Ah, this is in the sky. We should say there are many nuclear power plants. For example, in China, there are the Xi'an, the Jiuquan, and the Taiyuan nuclear power plants. We can invite visitors to visit the nuclear power plants and the nuclear power plants. We can feel the nuclear power plants and the nuclear power plants. We can feel the nuclear power plants. 啊，这个跟你看电视、看转播是不一样的。第二呢，我们在这个海南省、海南省，我们准备要建一个发射场，新的发射场。在发射场的时候，我们要同步建设一个航天主题文化公园，在那里面我们有设了地球啊、火星啊、月球啊、太阳啊这些一些区域，可以大家身临其境的去感受到火星、到太阳、到月月球的一些感受。这样的话，能激发我们大家的这些好奇心，然后创造精神。Do you think that is important to have those facilities so that it continues to generate political and popular support for the very large sums of money which are required for space exploration? People need to feel that they belong, that space belongs to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 因为太空实际上很神秘，离我们地球很远，但是实际上太空离我们也很近。刚才我前面讲了，我们的生活需要太空，我们每个人跟我们太空是这个都是紧密相关的。所以通过对地面设施的参观、考察，我们可以了解这个这个航天，了解这个太空的知识，还有所获得享受。我认为这是非常好的。I have to say, um, anyone who's involved in ground space tourism. You ought to make sure there's a money-back guarantee if the thing doesn't take off. The very first space shuttle launch that I covered, I drove for nine hours from Miami up to Cape Canaveral and 20 minutes away from the launch. They cancelled it for that day. Talk about it. Um, Eric, the... 50th anniversary, which is coming up. Tell us a bit about that. Well, actually, uh, tomorrow, April 12th, 2011, <laughs> will mark, we'll mark exactly 50 years from the launch, the successful launch and return of Yuri Gagarin, uh, who, as we, we all know, was the first person to go to orbit. It's a spectacular time. There's a lot of celebration. Um, and really, it's a time to look forward uh, I've been talking a lot about the next 50 years in space and what we can hope to see during those next five decades. Um, but it's remarkable, one thing I think it is worth to note, it's just remarkable how few people have actually been to space in the last 50 years. So though it's been 50 years, there have only been about 500 people in human history who have ever been in space. I mean, that is a very exclusive club. This is, this is a, a smaller number of people than there are billionaires, for example, on the planet. This is a smaller number of people than almost any other club, club I can think of. And uh, if there's one thing we've all, uh, we all hope to see in the space industry is that it now, you add several zeros to that for the next 50 years, that instead of 500, there'll be 500,000 or, or 50, you know, 5 million okay. or whatever. But we need to separate reality from fantasy. So talk me through the next five, 10, to 25 years. So the key for the next five years is that globally there, there, is a, there are a number of new uh, transportation systems that are under development right now uh, in various places by United States-based companies, by different governments, that in the next five years will begin to test fly and then debut. So the next five years is sort of a time of transformational transportation. New suborbital vehicles developed by my company and, and companies like Richard Branson's company. New orbital systems developed by private industry and again funded by governments, particularly in the United States where the shuttle is going out of service. And so those will be coming online. 
And then uh, as we get out into the 10 year time frame, I think that we will augment that as a global industry with, with destinations. Just pausing there to yeah. for Mr. Mr. Neal, when do you think it's reasonable, reasonable to assume that the first Chinese tourist would take to space? Uh 我一直认为这个地面的航天设施航天旅游是一块有待开发的而且前景很广阔的一块空余地 do, do you uh, follow on from that? Can you see a way in which your enterprises developed ground-based space tourism that, if you like, is parasitic on the, on the people going up there? Well, we already have, actually. It's, a, it's something that people have thought a lot about. So there are a number of now commercial space ports, if you will, that are under development and some, uh, uh, frankly, already approaching operational. Um, we have a, a space port in New Mexico in the United States uh, from which there'll be a number of suborbital companies that are flying. It was designed by uh, a famous designer, Philippe Stark. It has a number of uh, uh, ground-based attractions. And so these are, these are things that are happening. And then there's another sort of middle ground, which is the zero gravity flights, where you go up in an airplane and you can get uh, almost 10 minutes of weightlessness throughout this two hour flight, uh, broken up into 30 second pieces. And uh, we've had thousands and thousands of people do that, probably tens of thousands by this point. And that's only a few thousand US dollars, so that's well within the reach of someone who could save their money for some time. Mr. Visa, just a few thousand, please. Just would you mind raising my credit limit just for the purposes of today? Ladies and gentlemen, anyone got a question that you'd like to join in at this point? Put your hand up so I can see you. And yes, there's a lady, I think it's a lady in the middle there. <laughs> If, if anything, just put your hand up to make sure that I know you're still alive. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> what was your question? Do you pay a commission? Uh, we do. <coughs> um, Why, we are you interested? She wants in. Yeah, okay. Well, come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, a few minutes ago, you were speaking about some of the passengers who do this several times. And I was wondering whether you're connected with any of the alliances, One World, <laughs> Sky Team, Star Alliance, for frequent flyer miles. Um, that's, that's, that's interesting. Actually, a few years ago, we had a, a, a promotion with uh, the uh, Star Alliance. Uh, and it was, yeah, we did, actually, with US Airways and one of the other We've actually done this a few times, and, and, and one of our clients actually who orbited this uh, on the station was up there for 11 days and, and, and actually accrued about 3.5 million miles, because that's how far you go when you orbit for 11 days. So That'll sure, and there'll be more of that. And I think Richard Branson also, Sir Richard also has a system whereby you can use a million uh, virgin miles to get up on when they finally all, get All up. that will yeah. come, yeah. absolutely. Three and, a half mi uh, three and a half million miles will give them a lot of upgrades. That's right. Yeah, but if there's enough capacity to use them. <laughs> Any anybody else? Next question, please. Somebody out there. If we, if we yes? Well, shout. Thank you very much, good morning. Uh, my name is Stefanos Potiu from the United Nations Environment Program. Right. Um, I was looking at a documentary film, I think it was about one year ago, uh, and was saying that this flight, this, this space tourism, is going to be a sustainable one also. Uh, because probably, because I'm from the UNEP, uh, I don't know very well about sustainability, but could you explain to us 
how this space trip could be sustainable from an environmental and social point of view, what is going to be the contribution of this space trip to environment and social development? Why? What are you worried about? I'm just asking. No, I know. I'm, I'm curious to know, though. Huh? I, mean, I mean, it's a bit of <laughs> tourism, surely. Let me ask you, sir, Eric. I mean, a bit of tourism, but frankly, sending all these people up there, is it going to do any good? Or is it going to do some harm to the environment? So it's a, very, it's a great question. Uh, in actual fact, for a typical, for, for let's take the Soyuz, for example, which is the Russian rocket that takes people to the station now. So the, 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 you know, the carbon offset, so to speak, for one mission is only a few thousand dollars. Okay, we're talking about uh, the, the, the fuel, the propellants on board are hydrogen and oxygen. It's, when combined, they make water. And, uh, but let's even put that aside for a second. So the, the, the real answer is that actually space exploration is a fundamental capability that humanity needs. And one of the reasons why I got into this industry, aside from wanting to go myself, is that in space are limitless resources, okay? To get solar power from space and transmit it to the Earth is 20 times more efficient than doing it on the Earth's surface. Hang on. And doing things like going to asteroids and looking for resources. All the things that we, that we have on Earth that are scarce and that we have to do so much to the Earth that is not environmentally sound to get them, uh, we can do it in space at little cost. But the key to all of that is low cost transportation to and from space and uh, uh, re uh, reliable transportation and safe transportation. And frankly, all that is going to be developed by the early adopters in this tourism market. And so in some sense, you could say that the early adopters in tourism are really those who are paving the way for a future where space becomes part of the economic sphere of influence of the Earth. Mr. Yu, do you think that the private sector, because China is moving in such a fast way to, to, to bring in the private sector into so many areas. In fact, the Vice Premier talked about it this morning in terms of tourism, didn't he? He talked about the relationship between the private and the public sector. Do you think the, in this country, the private sector has a substantial role to play in the exploration of space? I think that the development of China, especially our ability to develop 可靠性越来越高，就是我们目前我们中国连续九十一次发射是这个百分之百成功的，啊，这可靠性高了以后，我相信将来这个旅游会逐步发展起来，这个私人的旅游公司也会发展起来，这个我是有信心的。So in that sense, in that sense, Eric, private and public, because that is a debate. That is now writ large in the United States, isn't it? This balance between the two, uh, as NASA's budget is cut back, as private industry takes up the slack. Well, I think that both private uh, efforts. I mean, space is an area where you've got to have both. Uh, the 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 government is a large customer, the biggest customer, uh, while at the same time, uh, private companies that can act. With uh, uh, you know, with innovative techniques and 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 be nimble in a market environment, really develop solutions much faster in many cases. And you you only have to look to some of the history. Frankly, what's in space actually is something that we use every day. You cannot walk 50 feet down the road or spend an hour uh, in your day without being benefited by something that comes from space. Whether it's your GPS and your iPhone, you know, the satellite TV that you get or anything else. And many of those systems and techniques were developed by private companies right. and the government working together. Any more questions before we uh, take some final thoughts from our panel? Your last chance, Lay. Ah, yes, yes, you're at the back. Um, wondering, uh, Thomas Steinmetz from eTurbo News, I'm wondering um, if I bought a ticket now to get on a round trip, hopefully round trip ticket to space, how much would I have to add for insurance? Or are there any insurance companies that would insure this trip? Gosh, I'm screwed. That's a great question, and uh, actually, so okay. there are d insurance, of course, is available. We have... Uh, How much uh, do you charge you for a premium? It's only a couple of percent. You know, the, 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 the space... The insurance, uh, actually, it's a very safe vehicle, comparatively. <laughs> it's it, the risk of, uh, you know, the risk... Th there hasn't been a catastrophic accident on board Possibly. the Soyuz in over 35 years. 
so right. it's been a long time. A couple of, uh, a couple of, is there another? Yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, hang on, hang on. Yes, carry on. Uh, Of course。他如何做到让自己的公司成为唯一一家经营这个太空旅游的公司的？他是全球唯一的一家，是因为特别有钱，还是因为他有跟政府的独特关系？呃，还有一个问题就是他自己有没有去过太空？他能不能形容
how do you think, you know, if we go back to the, the original days of travel, you know, the clipper class, the maids of the seas that flew over, the, 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 um, you then had the ocean liners, you had the 707, the 747, we've now got the whale, the, the A380. How does the prospect of space help more mundane everyday stuff? Oh, that's a great question, too. And really what it comes down to is that we're now in the 21st century. And if we can go to space as a destination, that just, that just proves the possibilities for our children, for our world, uh, in terms of there, there are really no limits to travel. And I think as an industry, it's just a wonderful thing that uh, the travel and tourism industry uh, has such a, uh, such a, a breadth of, of opportunities, including literally from the oceans to the stars above. And it's just a great, it's a great symbol of the future. Ladies and gentlemen, we may never get the chance to go to space, but we certainly have had the chance to dream about it. Our panel, thank you. To someone who's grown up uh, from the days of Gagarin and seen space uh, adventure, and to hear that it's actually suddenly becoming perhaps possible, I'm excited. I've actually been on the telephone to my kids, and they've given me permission to spend some of their inheritance to take a suborbital flight. So there you go. So, Ross, I'll be talking to you about my visa card as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree that it was stimulating, it was interesting, and it's perhaps a, a, a very fitting statement to say that uh, the, our conference is, uh, is, is uh, we have liftoff in many, many ways. So please join with me in thanking once again um, Eric, Mr. Wang, and the irrepressible Mr. Quest. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Absolutely fascinating.